Hey there, chemistry team. Are you ready for video number seven in our thermodynamics journey? Painful journey, <laughs> all right? I hope you enjoyed that derivation on that last one. Woo! All right. We are now where we want to be. We're in the Gibbs energy zone. Awesome. And so we don't really, well, we will have to calculate delta H's and delta S's to get delta G's, but we can just look at the value. If we could calculate delta G, the change in Gibbs energy for any reaction or process, we know if that's going to be spontaneous as written under the conditions specified if it's negative. If it's positive, it's not spontaneous. If it's equal to zero, it's at equilibrium. Sweet, man. Makes life nice. There, I agree. There's a lot of stuff in thermo. A lot of cal Some of these calculations took a long time. All right. Let's start out. Because really, we can calculate delta G at any condition, right? Any temperature, any pressure, concentrations for solution, da da da, da. But boy, that makes it difficult, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to start on the skateboard, and we'll get to the Ferrari later, all right? So let's do standard conditions first. Let's take baby steps. And the good thing about standard conditions is they're kind of a defined reference, all right? Um, kind of like we did for uh, enthalpy changes as well, where we did the... Um, the enthalpies of formation, standard enthalpies of formation, and defined elements at their standard states as zero, because effectively you're forming them from their elements in their standard states. So if you're forming an element from its elements in the standard states, that would be a value zero. Kind of gives you something to go off of, of reference state. And these are tabulated in the backs of books uh, for um, usually just a specific temperature. We can calculate delta G at any temperature, but if we're at standard conditions, we can kind of do a little shortcut here and use these values in the back, uh, uh, you know, the handout in the back of the book in the appendix or the one that I have on my website, which, you know, they're pretty limited. They don't have everything on there. But again, we cannot calculate absolute Gibbs energy values, just like we can't calculate absolute uh, enthalpy or internal energies. We can calculate absolute entropies because of the third law of thermodynamics. Oh, if you don't know what I'm talking about, go back and look at that video. All right. But we can calculate delta G, right? We can't calculate G here, state one. We can't calculate, can't calculate G here at state two, but we can calculate the difference between them. That's a path uh, independent function. It's a state function. All right, so we're going to start with a defined reference state of standard conditions, which we've talked about before. Um, and again, if we're at standard conditions, you'll see that little not symbol. So you see the delta G with that little not symbol. Up. That means look for those on exams. You see that go, boom, standard conditions. Nice. This will be an easier problem. Because if you don't see that little not symbol on there, you just see delta G, you're like, oh, crud monkeys. I'm not at standard conditions. <laughs> right? So we're going to do some videos at the end of this chapter on how to calculate Gibbs energy at non-standard conditions which is going to be standard conditions plus a correction factor for not being in standard conditions. So it's a pain in the behind to do non-standard conditions. Doable, but much more pleasant if you're a standard. All right. So standard conditions, again, you were at a pressure of one bar, which is effectively one atmosphere, because most people think in atmospheres, we go bar. Blah, blah. All, right. All species are pure. Uh, most stable form of that species, especially elements, uh, at the stated conditions. Usually, we're going to be at room temperature. Uh, if we're dealing with solutions, there uh, should be an activity of one, but we're assuming that they're dilute enough um, for a molarity of one where we'd have to worry about other factors. We can just use molarities of one and avoid the activity, you know, vomit. <laughs> Activities, oh, we hate those. So let me show you two different ways we can calculate delta G. I'll give you two equations. You've seen, sort of seen both of these before, but let's just put them up, back up there again. Two ways to calculate Gibbs energy changes at standard conditions. Uh, one's a little easier than the other. Depends on the temperature. Uh, and then we'll do uh, an example. All right, my friends. At least there's only two equations, which is nice. We're going to use one of them predominantly. And this is, again, at standard conditions. So you see that little delta G with that not symbol. You go, yes, standard conditions, defined reference states. All right. This is what you want to ask yourself as far as questions. You're reading through a problem on a quiz or an exam or a homework or lab, and you see calculate delta G naught. You have to go in your mind, I'm at standard conditions. Bingo, standard conditions. Your second question, the next question, what temperature am I at? That's going to make a world of difference in how long this problem is going to take. 
and you go, please, please, please be at roughly room temperature. Please, 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 please. Because these thermodynamic tables that we showed you, right, where you have all these values, those are only good at 298.15 Kelvin or 25 degrees Celsius. Any other temperature, we can't use that for calculating delta G values. So if you're at 25 degrees Celsius, which is, <clears throat> they could have picked any temperature, they just picked 25, which roughly represents room temperature. Um, if you're going to calculate uh, Gibbs energy changes at standard conditions, you can use those tables. Um, and again, 25 degrees Celsius, if you add 273.15, you get 298.15. A, a lot of books use just 298, right? They don't go out to the 0.15. So 298, 298.15, 25 degrees Celsius, good to go, roughly room temperature. We can use the same equation. You've seen this before twice. You've seen this equation with enthalpy changes. Delta H not reaction was exactly the same. Just put, it, put a capital H instead of a capital G. And the entropy, exact same thing with entropy. The only difference is with entropy, we have the absolute value S and you don't need the uh, deltas, right? And I give you all these equations on exam. So we just take the final state minus the initial state, final state being the products on the right-hand side of the arrow, initial state being the reactants on the left-hand side of the arrow. And the delta G sub F is exactly the same idea as the delta H sub F. It's the standard Gibbs energy of formation. Delta H F was the standard enthalpy of formation. So delta G formation is the, is the Gibbs energy of formation value. Uh, it's standard. I forgot to write standard here. Standard. And... Similar to delta H, not F, the enthalpy of standard enthalpy of formation, uh, Gibbs free energy is the free energy change that occurs when you form exactly one mole of a substance from its elements in their standard states. And by definition, elements in their standard states have values of zero. So the Gibbs uh, free energy of formation for any element would be zero. So if you look on the thermodynamic table, Anywhere, you're, anywhere you see an element in its standard state, say like magnesium solid there, the enthalpy of formation and the standard Gibbs free energy of formation are both zero, but the absolute entropy is not, right? That's not entropy change. That's using the third law of thermodynamics. So anywhere you see an element in its standard states, you're going to see zeros for both the uh, formation energy uh, for Gibbs and for enthalpy. They are zeros. Every other value tells you what is that Gibbs energy change when we form one, exactly one mole of that substance. So those are tabulated for you. It's really nice. So we can look up these values on that uh, thermodynamic table. That's uh, listed in the back of your book, and I give you those handouts on exams. And again, these new symbols, that's the stoichiometric coefficient in front of each product, stoichiometric coefficient in front of re each reactant, and you just summarize. So if you had three products, you'd have three terms here. If you had two reactants, you'd have two terms there. Sum them all up, limited by decimal places, and you're good to go. It gives you a Gibbs energy change under standard conditions. All right, great when you're at 25 degrees Celsius. If you're not at 25 degrees Celsius, you go, ah, crud, man. That's not going to be fun because you can't use that anymore. All right? You cannot use that equation if you're not at 25 degrees Celsius. You have to go back to the def the, how we derived from the second law of thermodynamics that Gibbs energy change is equal to the enthalpy change minus the absolute temperature in Kelvin times the entropy change. And I just put little not symbols in there. So you could have them at non-standard conditions, just remove the, the not symbols. But if you're at standard conditions, we're, we could be at any temperature, right? Standard conditions doesn't mean a specific temperature. It just means, at, you know, one atmosphere, one bar pressure, you know, you know all those kinds of things. So let's say I was at something other than 25 degrees Celsius. I would have to calculate delta H as standard conditions, delta S as standard conditions, and then plug in that temperature to calculate delta G. So it's a much longer. Here you can do it in one step at 25 degrees Celsius. If you're not at 25, it's three steps. you got to calculate delta H step one, delta S step two, plug in your temperature and get your delta G at step three. And we're going to do an example of this. There's going to be a pretty broad assumption here. Because how do we get delta H and delta S? Oh, my goodness. And we can do this. You can even do this at 25 degrees Celsius if you want to. You can always use this, but it just takes you a long time. So if you're at 25 degrees Celsius, think of this one as your shortcut, right? We're going to make an assumption 
that the delta H naught values and the delta S naught values, uh, you could use these thermodynamic tables at any temperature. We're going to assume temperature independent, right? So we could use delta H and delta S values from this, right? Even though it's an absolute, you can calculate delta S reactions, but we can't do it for delta G. It's too temperature dependent, all right? Uh, so again, look at the problem. You see it's a standard conditions. You go, what temperature? If you're at 25 degrees Celsius, do the shortcut. If you're not, do it the long way. Calculate delta H, delta S using these equations, and then plug in your temperature. So let's, let's do an example. All right. So hopefully you can do this on your own. So read, let's think about the problem and then pause it and see if you can calculate it. Make sure you've printed out the thermodynamic table from my website or you have the back of your book lugging that big old 90,000 pound creature <laughs> around with you doing bicep curls. You can use it and do bicep curls at the same time. Work your brain and your body uh, with those gigantic textbooks. Some of you might have the online versions which are a little bit lighter. All right. Is the following reactions fine? So part A. Oh, there's going to be a part B. Don't you love those on exams? Oh, if I screw up A, that automatically screws up B. I hate those. Is the following reaction spontaneous under standard conditions at 25 degrees Celsius? And remember, the two questions in thermodynamics. Am I standard conditions? If you are, smile. If not, cry a little bit. And then if you are at standard conditions, what temperature are you at? Oh, please let it be 25 degrees. Yay, it's at 25 degrees Celsius. I can use my shortcut. I can just go straight to the tables. Thermodynamic, thermodynamic table, thermodynamic tables, tongue twister. And I can do this in one, well, not one step, but, you know, kind of one step. Here's our equation. So we got some magnesium oxide solid reacting with some graphite. The pencil lead, right? Giving us some magnesium oxide. That doesn't look right. I've got the same species on the left and the right. There's a typo in here. Why would I form what I'm starting with? That should be magnesium solid. Har, 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 har. All right, so we got some magnesium oxide solid with carbon graphite giving us magnesium solid plus carbon monoxide gas. All right, that would have been really weird to calculate. Now, entropy-wise, we can kind of estimate. See how we we're, we're, have no gases here and we have gas there, so the, the moles of gases in, is increasing. So I would expect the entropy change of this uh, definitely to be positive. I don't know. I mean, we could calculate it, but it should be positive because we're increasing from no gas to some gas. So that should be a hugely positive uh, delta S. As far as delta H, that's pretty tough, right? Because we're breaking a bond here, but we're forming a bond there. So that uh, we'd have to calculate that. I can't really estimate whether delta H would be negative or positive in this scenario. So it'd be pretty tough to estimate whether delta G is going to be positive or negative in this. All right. But we're asking to be calculating delta G. Now, I might have said calculate delta G naught, or I could say at standard conditions. And if it's negative, it's spontaneous. If it's positive, it's not spontaneous. Pretty straightforward. If it's at zero, which it probably won't be in problems, that's at equilibrium. So because we're at 25 degrees Celsius and we're doing standard conditions, right? So standard conditions, you don't have to write this down. You can just do this in your head and smile because this is the shortest way. Now, remember, that's 298.15 Kelvin. We're going to use this equation, right? So we're going to use delta G not for the whole reaction. The Gibbs energy change or Gibbs free energy change for that whole process should be equal to the sum of all of our products. So we'll take the stoichiometric coefficients, which they're all one, so boring, right? Of our products times the Gibbs free energy change of formation, which is listed in your uh, appendix, minus, that's your final state, minus the sum, and this is again products, minus the same thing for the initial state, the reactants. So we'll do the stoichiometric coefficient for the reactants times the Gibbs free energy change of formation for our reactants provided for you on exams. So we know all of these values are one, and we just gotta look up the, the formation energy, uh, Gibbs energy, for magnesium oxide solid, graphite. Um, and if that's the most stable form of that element, that should be zero. And I think it is over diamond. 
Uh, magnesium is an element in standard state, so that should have a value of zero, and then carbon monoxide. Hey, all right, so grab your table, see if you can find those values. I'm going to erase this, put that equation back up on the board. Let's plug stuff into this equation, see what we get. All right, did you find your values? Because you want to you wanna get quick at finding things on these tables when you're doing quizzes and exams. You don't want to waste a lot of time farting around with that, right? All right, so I rewrote the equation. Delta G reaction will be, again, the products minus the reactants. So here's my product. So I have one. And in some places use one mole, some books don't. This, our particular textbook is doing those as unitless quantities, right, where the moles cancels out. And here's the, the Gibbs free energy formation for magnesium. And then we're going to take one times the Gibbs free energy for carbon monoxide, which we'll look up. And then we're going to subtract one times the Gibbs free energy formation for the magnesium oxide solid plus one times the Gibbs free energy formation for graphite. And I would expect the magnesium and the graphite to both be zero. Let's confirm that, though. Um, you know, obviously on an exam, I probably won't give you all coefficients of one. You might have a two or a three there, but it's the same kind of problem. Here we go. Let's plug these in. So this will equal one times uh, magnesium. Let's confirm magnesium is zero. So let's find magnesium. All right, so it's right on the top there, right? And don't use the first column. I know the tendencies to want to do the first column. We're doing the Gibbs energy formation, which is a big nothing, gigantic goose egg. So that will be zero. Um, oh, what are the units? What are the units on there? Kilojoules per mole. Note kilojoules per mole for the delta H formation. Uh, kilojoules per mole for the delta G formation, but for the absolute entropy, it's joules per mole Kelvin, right? A big mistake people make is when they're putting combining entropy and enthalpy terms together, the entropy is usually in joules, uh, and the uh, enthalpy and Gibbs are usually in kilojoules. So you got to watch out for that. You got to get that entropy into kilojoules so you can add those together. All right, so this would be zero kilojoules per mole. So that's going to be a net nothing. Let's do carbon monoxide. All right, so let's find carbon monoxide. Look under C for carbon, and it should be on there. So carbon monoxide's right there. Remember, it's the second column. The second column is the Gibbs energy formation. So carbon monoxide, negative 137.2. Negative one, don't do carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide gas, got to have the state, negative 137.2. Let's put that up there. kilojoules per mole. All right, so that's our first term. Whoops, I need a parentheses and a bracket. So I like to bracket each the products and bracket the reactants. So obviously that's going to phase out. Let's do the magnesium oxide. So we've got one of that. Let's look up magnesium oxide. Solid, right? So magnesium oxide solid is right there. And second column, negative 569.4 kilojoules per mole, right there. Negative 569.4. 569.4 kilojoules per mole plus one times the Gibbs free energy change formation for carbon graphite. If that's the most stable form of carbon, that allotrope of carbon versus, you know, buckyballs or diamond or something. Let's find carbon here. And let's find graphite. So see the two different allotropes of carbon? So you see how graphite is zero for those and not for diamond? That tells that graphite is the, is the stable form under those conditions. So that's going to be a value of zero kilojoules per mole. So well, that'll be zero kilojoules per mole. Good thing that was zero because I didn't have room to write a number on there. All right. So now we can just take these terms down. Let's figure out everything in this bracket for the products, figure out everything in that bracket for the reactants. And it uh, looks like we're going to be, it's all addition. We're going to be good to one decimal place across the board. All right. So that drops out. So this will be negative 137.2 kilojoules per mole minus. Now, if you did one mole here, the moles would cancel out and you'd end up with just kilojoules. 
right? And by definition, when you're done, it's kilojoules or kilojoules per molar reaction. So it really doesn't matter. All right. That phases out. So this will be negative 569.4 kilojoules per mole. So I'm subtracting a negative. So it looks like this. So that's bigger than that. So this is, and this is going to end up being a positive value. This will be not spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius under standard conditions. It's not going to be. I got one decimal, one decimal. So I'm going to one decimal. What do you get? 432.2. Kilojoules per mole, and there's no non rounded value there. Therefore, that is not spontaneous under these conditions at that temperature because delta G is greater than zero. Right? We derived the, de the delta S universe, uh, second law thermodynamics, all the way through to get delta G having to be negative. Uh, to be spontaneous because that gives you a delta S universe that's positive. Woo! Let's do a part B. Oh my goodness. All right, for part B, so we know from part A at standard conditions at 25 degrees Celsius, that, that reaction is definitely not spontaneous, not even close. Um, and we guess the delta S is going to be positive because we're forming a gas. Delta H we don't know, so obviously it's not going to be favorable as far as the enthalpy. So part B is kind of a logical extension, so it's not spontaneous at 25 degrees Celsius. Well, what temperature does it become spontaneous? Right. So this must be favorable as far as entropy change, but not favorable as far as enthalpy change, so we've got competing factors. So if we alter the temperature, we can overwhelm the fact that we have uh, a non-favorable delta H value by jacking up the temperature. So if we increase the temperature, that T delta S term becomes more negative and it can overwhelm the positive delta H. But we don't know what temperature that is. So I wrote this back up. What I'm going to do, this is going to be a long problem. Um, I'm going to do that on a separate video. So we're going to end this video here. And on the next video, we'll, I'll show you how do we approach these kinds of problems and how do we solve this specific one. So next video coming.